For your first homework assignment, you are going to be creating a rectilinear construction. This consists of three intersecting blocks, a primary block which by definition is going to sit on the top plane and be aligned with the front plane and the right plane, a secondary block which intersects it and is perhaps often a little less smaller than the primary block, but not in this case. And finally, a tertiary block, which will probably be a thinner, smaller slab that's going to intersect through both the primary and secondary block, or at least through one of them. All these need to be interconnected some way so that they form one solid structure. Most of this is pretty easy because all three blocks are simple, extruded forms. The only difficult part of this assignment is probably the creation of additional planes beyond the ones that come with the standard part when it's first started. For example, this tertiary slab needs to be created on a plane which is floating above the top plane. And the secondary slab is sitting just a little bit in front of the front plane, meaning that there needs to be a new plane sitting just in front of the front plane that a sketch for this block can be drawn upon. I will just go through these one at a time, and since everybody's rectilinear construction will be different, you'll just have to adapt these ideas to your situation. Rolling back to the beginning, we'll just look at the primary block simple extrude, nothing more than a rectangle drawn on the top plane with a coincident relation between the upper left corner of the rectangle and the origin of the coordinate system. That automatically aligns this edge with the front plane and this edge with the right plane. Notice that all the sketch elements are black, meaning that this is fully defined. The only way we can do that is to both locate the rectangle and to give it some dimensions. Finally, the rectangle is extruded using a blind extrude to whatever is the desired height. The next step is probably to add the additional planes for the other blocks. What I'm going to do is just show the planes and then at the end of this process show how they were actually created. So one plane is a plane for the secondary block. In this case it's sitting only 0.05 inches in front of the front plane, but it could be any dimension. And then the tertiary plane, which I will show, you see is floating above the top plane. So to create the secondary block, we're going to be drawing on the secondary sketch plane, and we will just be drawing a rectangle and extruding that. So I'll roll this forward. We'll take a look at what the sketch looks like for that. We see that we simply have, once again, a rectangular sketch drawn on our new plane. Two dimensions define the width and height of this block, and two additional dimensions define the location of the block in space. In this case, we're going to measure it back to the origin. By measuring this block back to the origin, we can independently control the location of this block from the location of the primary block. That way, is even if the primary block were to move for some reason, we wouldn't have to worry about the secondary block moving with it. This then is again a simple blind extrusion. In this case we're going forward. That gives us our second block. If we zoom in here we can see that this edge of the block is a little bit in front of this surface of our primary block. The tertiary block then is going to be drawn on this plane here. Rolling forward, we'll take a look at the sketch. Once again, all we're doing is clicking on this surface, starting a new sketch, 
and again drawing a new rectangle and again we're going to dimension the width of the rectangle and the length of the rectangle and then somehow locate that rectangle with respect to the origin which is right here. So that means that this edge of the rectangle is 4.5 inches from the origin and this edge was 2 inches from the origin. We could have easily picked different edges to locate it. But the key here is we're trying to control the overall length and the overall width independently of where the location of the block is going to be. Once again, this is just a simple extrusion, a blind extrusion going upward. And here we have our three blocks. The last step is to create some fillets on the edges of all the blocks. I'm going to hide the planes to make this a little easier to see. And what we want to do for this assignment is have vertical fillets added to the vertical edges of a one particular size, whatever you choose, and a different size fillet added to the horizontal edges. So you see that this is clearly a smaller fillet than this is here. As a result, the fillet sort of wraps around the corner along the top edge. I've not bothered to put any fillets along the edges where the blocks intersect with each other. We just want the outside edges with the fillets on them. I'll show you the easy way to add these on. Just roll this back. We always want to take advantage of the features that are built into SOLIDWORKS to reduce our work. So when I add my vertical fillets, I'll just choose a particular size here. I'll click on only vertical edges. And I'll make these a little bit bigger. And we missed one right there. Those are my vertical edges. Now when I add my horizontal edges, I want to take advantage of the fact that on all these edges, I have one continuous tangent pathway that will allow me to easily add the fillet without having to click on all these individual edges. So I'm going to click on a new fillet. I'm purposely going to make this one a little smaller. I'll make this 0.2. And I'm going to use the tangent propagation option. By doing this, it will guarantee that by just clicking one edge, it will look for a contiguous pathway all around, provided that those elements are tangent to each other. So just clicking on this edge automatically fillets the entire horizontal edge. The same here, 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 and here, and I think there's one down here. You see I was able to do all this with just eight clicks as opposed to clicking on what would have been about 32 or so edges if I had to pick them individually without using the tangent propagation feature. And that's my finished product. So let's talk about how those additional planes were put into this model. I'm going to roll this back to the primary block. I'm also going to turn my planes back on. Here we're back to just our three standard planes. Planes are what are known as reference geometry in SOLIDWORKS. The commands for that can be found in the reference geometry tab. It's on the features tab of the command manager. You'll recall that we wanted to have a plane for the secondary block that was a little bit in front of the front plane. This is one of the easiest types of planes to add. What we're going to use is an already existing plane as a reference for adding a new plane. We'll go to the reference geometry, click on the down arrow, access plane. We see we open up a dialog box. It says first reference, second reference, and third reference. References are pre-existing geometry that you're going to use to help locate your plane. 
For example, a reference can be an already existing plane, an already existing flat face of, an, of a solid piece of geometry. In this case, both of these references are two-dimensional. Reference can also be an edge, or it can be an axis, which is not shown here, or it could even be a line located in a sketch. Those would be one-dimensional references. Finally, a reference could always be the vertex of a piece of solid geometry, or it could be a point located in a sketch. Usually you need at least two and sometimes three references to locate a new plane. The fewer the references you have, the more information that has to be added in order to create one unambiguous location for your new plane. The very easiest way to add a plane is to make a new plane parallel to an already existing plane or face. So our reference in this case is going to be, in this case we'll choose our front plane, and if we don't choose any other references, we have to give it some additional information here in the first reference box. This always ends up defaulting under this condition to a distance, an offset distance, from the plane that was selected. And here apparently it's just whatever was the previous number input, 3.937 inches. This is the distance from our reference, the first plane, the front plane rather, to our new plane that's going to be created. So I'm going to type in a number like 1. And what this will do is create a plane that is 1 inch away from my reference plane. That is the simplest way to add a plane. So a parallel, this creates a plane which is offset from the reference plane, meaning that it's also parallel to that plane so if this plane is continued on into infinity, and this plane is continued on into infinity, they are the same distance apart all the way out into infinity. In fact, planes do extend to infinity, but SOLIDWORKS just shows them as having an edge on them so we can easily visualize where they're located. We can actually grab these planes just by clicking on them, and we can resize them as we desire. This does not actually change the true nature of the plane. The plane goes out to infinity, but sometimes this is a little more convenient. Sometimes you want the plane to be just large enough to see, or sometimes you want to make it bigger in order to encompass other geometry. Changing these edges of the plane will not affect your model in any way. If I click on this plane, either in the graphics window or in the feature tree, we see what highlights is a 1. This is the 1 inch dimension that was used to locate the plane. This means that the plane is also parametrically located, just like any other parametric feature. I can always go back and change this if I want, just by double clicking on it and giving it a new dimension. You see now the plane has moved. If I draw a feature on this plane, I'll just draw a sketch. and I will extrude it. And if I change the location of that plane parametrically, change it back to one inch, we see that because the plane moved and the fact that the sketch for this slab was drawn on that plane, the result is that the entire slab has moved as well. So this is a way that you can parametrically control the location of this slab. You, we can control its location this way, and its location this way or this way is controlled by how the sketch is drawn. So in order to control that, I would want to add some more dimensions, like from one from the origin to the base, the origin to an edge, and I can add another dimension which controls its size. So if I want to control how this moves left to right or up and down, I can just double click on these dimensions 
either while I'm editing the sketch or when I'm out of the sketch, and that will change the location of the slab, in this case, in the X and Y axes. And changing the location of the slab in the Z axis, in this case, will be done by changing the location of the plane that the sketch is on. So I've gone and deleted that temporary plane and that temporary block. And I'm going to roll forward again to my true secondary sketch plane. If I double click on this, or rather single click on it, I can see a dimension of 0.05. That's the distance from my secondary sketch plane to my front plane. And if I edit this plane by right clicking on the feature in the feature tree, going up into Edit Feature, I get back to my Properties Manager and we can see that the front plane was the first reference and the distance away from that reference was 0.05 inches. I'll roll forward again. Here's our tertiary plane. And we see that this is 3 inches above the top plane. I'll right click and edit that feature. We see that in this case the top plane was the reference and 3 inches was the distance of the offset distance between that plane and the top plane. Then it was just a matter of drawing sketches on these brand new planes and properly locating them. So here's our sketch for the secondary block. Here's our sketch for the tertiary block. You see I can click on this sketch when I'm not even editing it, just simply clicking on it. That highlights the dimensions that were made for the sketch. I can always change a dimension here. I'll change this 12 to 10. You see the block changes its size without affecting anything else. I can click on that dimension again. I'll click on this 2 inch dimension which locates the height of the block. I'll change it to 3. Hit rebuild. And the block actually shifted, the bottom of the block actually shifted up along with the top. If I go back and click on the secondary sketch plane, Double click on this 0.05 dimension. Make me make that 0.5 instead of 0.05. Sometimes you have to hit the rebuild button. See now what that did was it shifted that plane forward, moving the entire block with it. Shift that a little bit more. Move that to one inch. You see that's moved the entire block forward. So this is going to be your goal when you build your model is to be able to build each block so you can move them freely by changing numbers so that they can move in the Z, X, and Y axes and that you can also easily change what their size and thickness is all just by changing numbers. The last thing you want to do with this assignment is to rename your features in the feature tree. You've probably noticed that whenever you create a new feature, I'll just make one on the front plane, It always gives a generic sort of a name, like Boss Extrude 2. This isn't such a big problem when you're designing a small part, but pretty soon you'll find that as you get large and complicated assemblies and parts, that having these generic names can be very confusing. So what you want to be able to do is rename these to something that makes a little more sense to you and possibly your coworkers. All you have to do, the easy way, is to just mouse over the name left click on it and you can either click a second time on it after a slight pause and that puts you into an edit mode for the name so I'll just type in primary block and then click somewhere out of that or another method is to left click on it and hit your F2 key and that will put you into an edit mode as well. That's it, I hope this is